Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff and um, uh, welcome uh, listening to what he has to say. We The format for these seminars is that uh, we'll take some time for a presentation. Um, it's up to the presenter to decide exactly how long they want to do a formal presentation. And Jeff will tell us if he's comfortable accepting questions along the way or if he'd rather have you hold them. And um, then we're going to take some time to go into meeting for worship on the occasion of research, as we call it, uh, to reflect on what we've heard from Jeff and see what bubbles up that feels like it's important to share with Jeff to support him and um, help him advance his research. So thank you, Jeff, for doing this. I like the deep breaths idea from Gray yesterday. <laughs> I, I do do that um, to settle myself. And yeah, so good morning, everybody. And uh, I'm pleased to have this chance to tell you about a project I'm working on and, and get your feedback. It is. Um, something that's sort of just crept up this year. And it coincides really nicely with the summer research seminar. The theme of this project is ensuring intergenerational equity and in ecosystem management. And, and actually, as I was putting this presentation together, I, uh, you know, we, we, I think last year we had a presentation on regenerative agriculture. And I, and I said, well, I think what we're talking about here is regenerative ecosystem management. So that's the title that I've come up with uh, for the presentation um, today. In regard to what Shelley said about questions, I, I guess I would prefer having, whoops, I can't get to that chat, no. Oh, I'm all lost, here we go. Okay. Um, if you have a question for clarification, that seems like it'll get lost. Uh, if it's not addressed during my presentation, please do either jump in with it or send a chat and I'll try to address it. Otherwise, I think it, it might work best. Um, to, I've, I've come up with some queries at the end um, on things I'm interested in hearing in addition to anything else you wanna say. Uh, so, so maybe we can proceed um, that way. So. My um, project comes from an assignment I have from the United Nations, a contract I received somewhat unexpectedly um, through a group, uh, a contact with a group called the Bold Rethink. Um, and my friend there sent me a note that said the UN is, wants to put together this strategy guidance note on looking at how notions of intergenerational equity can be brought into ecosystem management. And I said, sure, I'm, I'm interested, put my name in and I end up getting this contract, which is a very quick contract. So I have to have a draft due, a draft next week. And I've been working on that. Um, I'll send it out for comment. And then I have to do a final draft in about a month following that. So boom, boom, boom. Um, and my mind has just been swirling with some ideas that I've tried to organize uh, in this presentation. It's been helpful to have this, to try to draw some ideas together, but I think you'll see they're still gelling. And I'm so grateful to be able to do this and get your uh, feedback. The 
audience here is policymakers and centers of government and ministries of finance, planning, and public administration. That's pretty much straight out of the terms of reference, uh, which also say that the note should stress institutional issues and indicate how a government can both assess its current status and measure progress in applying the strategy to national policymaking processes. They also make reference to these, um, I think it's 11 principles of effective governance in sustainable development that a working group as part of this part of the UN uh, came up with. So some of those have to deal with the effectiveness of governance, questions of competence, uh, sound policy and collaboration, some to do with accountability, so integrity, transparency, and independent oversight, and then some to do with inclusiveness, <clears throat> leaving no, nobody behind, kind of an intragenerational equity element, non-discrimination, opportunities for fair participation, and open, you know, complement to transparency, subsidiarity, this idea of uh, matching governance to the appropriate level uh, from the global to the local scale, and then this ex explicit um, principle of intergenerational equity, which is at the heart of sustainable development. Um, and they also list uh, in their description of it, the questions of debt management. So um, uh, a, a current generation that's heavily burdened with debt is passing on a problem to the future, for example, long-term planning. And then ecosystem management comes in in the way they've framed this. So this is, this is sort of what I'm, jumping off from. So what I decided to do is first try to figure out, well, what, what are we talking about when, when we talk about ecosystem management? And uh, that's a term that's fairly new, actually. Ecosystems is an older term, but uh, ecosystem management as a term was originally coined, apparently, in 1992 by the US Forest Service chief. And it's come to uh, represent a few key elements. Um, because it's management, it has this element of being intentional and goal-driven. Um, because it's tied to ecosystems, there's a strong notion of adaptive management. So uh, an approach to management in which you're continually monitoring what's going on and making adjustments all the way. So you're not sort of doing a one shot imposing an outcome and then leaving it, you are staying on top of it. Um, it's a systems-based approach because it uses the word ecosystem. Um, and then maybe the one of the harder elements but inevitable elements is that it inevitably brings in questions of public values. So just because you say ecosystem management does not mean that you have any particular goal uh, in mind for that ecosystem. And when you think about it, and as I go through this, you'll see you can have many different goals um, and uh, that can lead to, to public debate, uh, disagreements and so on. But then there's this also idea of sustainability and sustaining ecological processes over time. Um, it seems to me a threshold issue in, in, in figuring out what ecosystem management is, is, is really the choice of what ecosystem you're talking about. And so one thing that I'll be addressing uh, as I go through this and in the paper is what scale we're talking about. What scale is this management managed ecosystem we're talking about defined and what are its boundaries? So we know that, um, on political maps, you can have political boundaries uh, that can cut across uh, ecosystems. Uh, those can be their national boundaries or other subnational boundaries, or they could be the boundaries around a, a protected area, a national park, a forest, uh, or so on. So these are some of the things that have to be figured out um, in, in taking the ecosystem management approach. Another thing is that there's basically two, uh, across the spectrum, two uh, basic approaches that have been proposed for ecosystem management. And for me, this, this has echoes back to, if you are familiar with this, the sort of the uh, 
the Gifford Pinchot versus John Muir approach to how we deal with our wild areas, um, conservation versus preservation perhaps. But I think that this even goes beyond that. So one idea is that ecosystem management is really a, a tweaking of what was known before as natural resources management. Um, and again, that this is a lot of this is coming out of how uh, lands and natural resources on the public lands in the United States were, were being managed. Uh, so for example, you have national forests. So in, in my work in the US Justice Department, you know that the forests were a good representative of, of multiple use um, approaches. So some you could use uh, national forests for timber harvesting, which they are, there's mining in national forests, there are grazing leases. There are also uh, recreational opportunities that are supported. And then there's wilderness. So you have a broad spectrum of ways in which those particular uh, ecosystems are, are managed. Um, but in this approach, when you're just tweaking sort of what was happening before this phrase was coined, it still seems to be quite anthropocentric with a focus on serving human needs and wants. Even in wilderness, it's that uh, um, uh, the way this is cast uh, is often in, in, in terms of the value of, of, of knowing that there's wilderness or experiencing the most pristine forms of wilderness from a human perspective. So a shorthand for this kind of approach might be the ecosystem services approach to humans. Now, you can end up providing quite a bit of protection uh, for ecosystems from this approach, but it is quite anthropocentric. And then there's you know, the deep ecology approach here, which looks at the notion of ecosystem management as more revolutionary, that this should be something new. It should be a much more holistic approach than was taken before. It should be more ecocentric and look at humans as part of ecosystems uh, or perhaps uh, take a human inclusive ecocentric approach, uh, 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 a formulation that I um, used in my work and have settled on more or less. And, I, and one way to think about this approach might be um, the rights of nature as opposed to ecosystem services, where we're not just looking at this, uh, the importance of ecosystems for people, uh, but also for the other living beings with which we share our common heritage on this planet. Um, and, and, and this uh, dichotomy of views, uh, or if you can look at these as maybe the endpoints on the longest spectrum, are, are still really part of um, the discussions on how ecosystem management should be applied. Uh, another important thing to think about in regard to this is the scale at which we're, we're talking. So in ecological studies, uh, we often look at scales going all the way from the organism, which would be individual organisms or species to populations of those organisms, and then communities, communities which are groups of those populations or sort of an, an interspecies community. And then when you go up to the ecosystem level, you're combining both the biotic and abiotic elements together. So what is the what are the rock formations? What are the aquatic uh, systems that are part of this and so on? And then you can have groupings of ecosystems at broad geographic scales, which are called biomes or ecozones. And when you put them all together at the global scale, you're talking about the biosphere, the ecosphere. Um, so this seems to ca call for some sorting out in terms of what we're talking about when we talk about ecosystem management. Uh, and then there's also, I think, some more contemporary permutations that are important to keep in mind here. So we have urban ecosystems, agroecosystems, social ecological systems. So how do those things come into play in this, um, in, in trying to develop uh, strategies for ecosystem management? Just to take a little deeper look at the scale, I, I thought it was interesting to consider this map. So these are the major terrestrial uh, biomes. Um, 
So these would be, again, groupings of ecosystems that are more or less uh, categorized in these broad categories, tundra or boreal forest or tropical rainforest and so on. But to make it even more complicated, the starting point for a project like, like this has to also take into account um, the effects of human presence in all of those biomes for um, millennia. Uh, and so there's a paper that I found um, quite eye-opening that mapped, uh, and, and this was a, with a professor who was at McGill University, is now at University of British Columbia, Naveen Ramankadi uh, and Earl Ellis wrote this paper on anthropogenic biomes, showing that 75% of ice-free land um, on, on, on Earth is, is altered or impacted by human use in some way, and only less than a quarter can be, is, is what they call wildlands. And this map shows at a very, very uh, small uh, scale, uh, you know, small grid, uh, what kinds of anthropogenic biomes now exist on Earth. So from dense settlements, villages, croplands, rangelands, forested, um, and so on. Um, so that seems another thing to take into account in defining the ecosystems we're talking about and what kind of management we're talking about. So the other element here is intergenerational equity. Uh, and this is a concept that is really inherent in the notion of sustainability. So even going back 50 years ago, um, you know, ne next year will be 50 years since uh, the Stockholm uh, uh, Conference on the Human Environment. And the first principle there is that human humanity bears a solemn responsibility to protect and improve the environment for present and future generations. And then that was followed up uh, by the Brundtland Commission in 1987 that sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So intergenerational uh, equity is about putting these principles into practice. One of the leading scholars on the notion of intergenerational equity is Edie Brown Weiss of Georgetown University. And she has identified these three principles. First, that Intergenerational equity is about conservation of options or conserving a sufficient amount of diversity within ecosystems to allow future generations to solve their own uh, problems. Uh, this for me resonates, for example, with the work of, of Martha Nussbaum or Amartya Sen in terms of allowing capabilities. So you, you at least allow the conditions for people to have the capacity uh, to, for well being. This sort of translates that. Um, into an ecosystem setting across generations. Um, conservation of quality, leave ecosystems in no worse condition than you receive them um, as a generation. And this can mean uh, not harming or preserving what's still in good shape. But I think an important element here um, that, I, that I feel inclined to emphasize a fair bit um, in this uh, project and in this paper and strategy note is, is, is restoration because so much of the planet um, is in need of restoration. Um, so many ecosystems uh, are not only altered, but altered in a, in, 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 a, in a harmful way, in a way that needs to be uh, corrected. And then conservation of access uh, is about ensuring equitable rights of access to, access to the legacy of past generations. Um, so uh, the way that Edie Brown West describes is it's a way of incorporating notions of intergener intergenerational equity across um, generations. And the question here is, are, are we talking about only people or are we also talking about um, other creatures? And it's my inclination, of course, would be to include not just people. So. I put these uh, two concepts together, ecosystem management and intergenerational equity, and came with, up with this idea of regenerative ecosystem management. And the working definition I have, uh, and, and please, this is something I, I, I would welcome uh, your suggestions on, is that this is intentional goal-driven 
an adaptive intervention to restore, preserve, or improve the structure and functioning of an ecosystem with a view to passing it on to future generations of life in the same or better condition as in this generation. Um, building on what I said so earlier, this remains a, a very systems-based and adaptive form of, of management. Uh, for me, if something's systems-based, it's almost necessarily adaptive because systems, especially ecosystems, are always evolving. I think it needs to include the intention not to actively intervene, especially if we're talking about uh, uh, what's, what, what central governments or national governments do, and I'll expand on this in, in a little bit. Um, and, and really, this is one way you could look at this is, is that we're talking about living off the income of what our ecosystems provide, but preserving or restoring uh, the capital or the principle. I'm inclined, as I said, to incorporate in this some core ideas and approaches in ecological and ecocultural restoration. Um, so in, in my work, in, in my book that uh, I published in the past year, uh, Ecological Law and the Planetary Crisis, I, I talk about the lessons we can learn from ecological and ecocultural restoration that seem very relevant here. So what we're talking about here is the process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem or an ecocultural system, which in many ways is more interesting to me, that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. Um, and some features of this that resonate with this idea of regenerative ecosystem management, first of all, is that it's intentional goal-oriented goal intervention. Um, uh, so management is, is, is sort of carries with it this idea of having a goal in mind. What kind of goal? Well, that's, that's again, a big debate and brings in that question of public value again. Um, in ecological uh, and ecocultural restoration, uh, there's typically reference to historical conditions in which a mutually enhancing human earth relationship existed or in which the desired goal seemed to have been achieved. Um, and then restoration is trying to achieve those again in a new form, in a kind of an evolutionary way in the future, building on what we know from the past of that place. Um, it recognizes embedded, resilient, and communal connections of people in place, in particular, um, ecocultural restoration. But even with the ecosystem re re restoration in places where uh, humans don't have an, an active role, the fact that humans aren't actively um, involved it, it, it is, in a way, defining the relationship of humans to that place. Um, there is almost inevitably in this because these tend to be fairly local scale projects in, in most kinds of ecological and ecocultural restoration, a strong focus on locally tailored options. So a question uh, that lingers in this in general and that uh, resonates in this project and that it's, it's it, in that this idea could be incorporated there is can we apply this approach beyond site specific small scale restoration efforts to multi scale restoration up to the global level. So, looking back at that progression from organism to population to community to ecosystem to landscape, maybe is something in between ecosystem and biome. Can we scale these things up? And if so, how? And then related to this is the work of Eleanor Ostrom and other people. Agrawal is another uh, big scholar and um, researcher who's tried to figure out how certain communities have managed to successfully and sustainably manage what, what are called common pool resources over long, long periods of time. And Ostrom, um, who, who, who got the uh, Nobel Prize in economics for this work, uh, came up with these um, criteria, which from all of the case studies she looked at seemed to be necessary, not, not just some of them, but all of them pretty much together. First, that you have clearly defined uh, boundaries. So there is the notion in, when you're talking about common pool resources of, of exclusion, the people who have access um, is defined. This distinguishes these studies from what are called open access resources, things like um, the air or 
uh, in, in, in many senses, ocean fisheries where, where the populations of fish are very hard to track. And so open access, uh, it's really open access more than um, access within a, within a defined uh, exclusionary pool. You have congruence between the appropriation and provision rules and local conditions. This is another way to say that the rules about how that those resources can be accessed are, are, are locally tailored. They're tailored to the ecosystem that you're talking about. What's also locally tailored are the collective choice arrangements. So you're dealing with a fairly large community of people in these cases, typically. Um, and they've come up with ways to make decisions about those resources and access to them collectively. Uh, I'll give you an example just to give some context there, because otherwise it can lose, can be pretty abstract. So one of the studies that they looked at, that she looked at, was the irrigation and water management regime around the agricultural fields outside of Valencia, uh, Spain. So this is, uh, you know, not a water-rich area, a place where you have to be careful about how water is used. And over centuries, at least generation to generation, rules were developed about how the people that had access to these water systems could, could access the water um, without um, depleting it and, and with being fair among, uh, among themselves. So this requires monitoring with accountability. Um, so it can't be a, a free for, for all, there has to be some tracking. Graduated sanctions. You know, when I first looked at this work, I, I had done work in, in environment in, in the environmental office at the Environmental Protection Agency, where, you know, the rule was you must, uh, you know, recapture the economic benefit and you must have an, a, an amount above that that punishes to create deterrence. Well, what her study said is what you need is something that works within that community. So again, it's very locally tailored. It has to work. But the sanctions graduated, meaning you still have a, a range of sanctions depending on what the violation is. Um, but they're the ones that work within that community. There have to be mechanisms for resolving conflicts. So you can imagine irrigators in that system outside of Valencia, there can be fights between different users. There has to be a way to resolve those. And this one is really key, I think, for addressing how this kind of how these examples would work uh, with respect to this particular project. Minimal recognition of the rights to organize. So this means that uh, the central government or governments at a higher level than the local community that's dealing with this common pool resource has to be given uh, the ability to create all of these rules. In other words, they don't get so superseded by a central authority. Uh, or undermined in, in, in another way. So this is this question of deciding not to intervene when you have a system that is working well uh, that allows sustainable use of a resource. Um, nested um, enterprise is really about that different levels of government and governance work together to allow these systems to work. And the final one, I don't, I think I might have added this, but for me, it flows out of this, as I, as I explained a little already, is that these, these examples are all, the ones that work are all ones in which there's a strong attachment to place. And in many cases, it's because there is intergenerational continuity. So you have families that um, stay there and continue to be part of the system. They're, um, they're not using the resource to make money in the short term and then getting out of there. Um, there, there is there, there's some element in how that system works uh, that ensures one generation cares uh, for the generation that's to come. So these are just when you when you when you put these lessons from ecocultural restoration and research on common pool resources together again. A key role for human choice, intention, and goal-oriented intervention. That's definitely true with anything that's going to be called ecosystem management or regenerative ecosystem management. Monitoring and adaptation, uh, again, seems to be uh, uh, common to all three, uh, ecocultural restoration, common resources, and ecosystem management. 
a flexible range of um, options. So reference to historical, con historical conditions with mutually enhancing human earth relationship, emphasis on embedded resilient and communal connections of people in place and, a fo and focus on locally tailored options and enhancing attachment to place. Um, there is no one right answer in these things. Um, a lot of the work in eco-cultural restoration and common pool resources is allowing a set of rules uh, that give flexibility for staying in a range in which sustainable development of the ecosystem or the common pool resource is maintained. Uh, a, a big part of this is that you have participatory dialogue um, and participatory decision-making. Um, this cannot be a top-down hierarchical or authoritarian regime. It requires community. So I wanted to bring up again that some of the questions of, of scale and, 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 and some challenges that uh, that's posing and how to frame this in, in, in this strategy guidance note. So we know that with any um, ecosystem, we really need to look from the local to the global scale because of the state of play on the planet right now. So at the global scale, I think it's important to bring into this the idea of the planetary boundaries and their interactions. So we know that there are pressures that build up from what's happening at the local level and local ecosystems around the planet that work their way all up to the planetary level. And in the research on planetary boundaries, it's become clear that these the, the overarching is issues for all ecosystems can often be framed either in terms of climate change, where you have this tremendous amount of information coming out of the IPCC reports, and or biodiversity and species abundance. And now you have the equivalent of the IPCC um, and the IPBES working um, under the auspices of the Convention on Biodiversity uh, that's doing these global reports as well on the state of, of, of biodiversity and the challenges uh, that we have there. We're focused a lot on climate change and rightly so, uh, but um, the biodiversity diversity challenges is, is at least as important. So, the global scale has to be taken into account, I think, even if you're looking at the local scale, and I'll explain that in a little bit. You also have questions of, of, of cross-scale dynamics or cross-scale perspectives. So one thing that this made me think of is that the trade-offs and management objectives may, may differ at different scales. And an example is, you know, how do you consider the sustainability of a hydroelectric dam? At the local scale, it may seem unsustainable or undesirable because it, it, it causes major disruption of local ecosystems and people. And this would be especially true with large hydroelectric projects. And in fact, we know that some of those are being taken down around the world. But at the global scale, we may not end up with a net reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And so there would be a positive. So how do you negotiate those different trade-offs across scale? And then the, another point here, is that um, sub-local ecosystems aren't isolated. So what is within the scope of management and what is outside of it? And when I say what's outside of it, if you're talking about national level managers, what do they really have no control over because you're dealing with a global scale problem like climate change or biodiversity loss? So one way to break this down for something like using, you, you could use other global scale phenomena, but it's, it's maybe most evident in terms of climate change, you have a boundary metric like the carbon dioxide um, in the atmosphere uh, that is creating a pressure uh, that, uh, that we can't cross this boundary. So we know that's what 350 parts per million say for, for CO2 in the atmosphere. What are um, the pressures uh, on that boundary? Um, emissions of greenhouse gases and decreasing of sinks. So destruction of forests and other sinks, for example. The economic drivers, burning fossil fuels and deforestation. And then how are those drivers and impacts distributed um, 
around uh, the world. And you can break that down in all kinds of different ways. You could do sectoral distribution, what's coming from the automobile sector, from the um, oil production sector, whatever it is. You can break it down and look at it in material energy flows. And there are enormous amounts of studies that look at it from that perspective. You can look at geographic and ecosystemic distribution. Um, uh, from ecosystems, maybe it's uh, particularly important on the impacts. Where are these uh, beyond the boundaries in, uh, drivers of change um, influencing local ecosystems? And what does that mean about how what can be done at the local level has to be paired with act, action? And if you're talking about climate change, action among all the nations of the world to address the parts of that that are beyond the control of the local ecosystem managers. Uh, yeah, and then consideration with all that information, that's when you can consider societal responses at different levels and across levels. Uh, the planetary boundaries authors talk about myriad pathways to develop within the constraints represented by the planetary boundaries. I, I like that framework because it's a positive thing. It's like there's many, many ways to do this, not, oh my gosh, we're, 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 we can't do anything anymore, we're restricted. No, you have um, uh, um, all kinds of room for creativity and innovation, not just technological, but social and cultural innovation as well. So some key challenges in this. In our current framing, dominant framing, ecosystems are often considered storehouses for human provisioning and development. And whether you like that framing or not, the fact is that humans uh, uh, have for millennia and millennia, and many people point to the development of large-scale agriculture and permanent settlements as kind of the key change in the Neolithic uh, transition. We've used our ecosystems as storehouses. We have gone uh, beyond just taking the, the flow, uh, which was associated with, with hunting and gathering, with actually creating storehouses through agriculture and other things. Um, that beyond, beyond just go beyond just living off the surplus. So th this is a challenge that, that, that won't go away. And it's represented by, by agriculture. And we have some extreme examples here that really put in stark focus the challenge here. When you look at things like palm oil plantations being converted on an industrial scale in Indonesia, for example, we have extractive activities all over the world that are really a one more one way street. It's hard to think about things like say the circular economy when you're talking about um, uh, mineral or, or fossil fuel mines. And one of the examples that I reading, was reading about recently that was just um, uh, heartbreaking and ghastly to read about is a proposed, proposed conversion of the ancient, has, I don't know if I'll say this right, has Deo around forests in India into 40 new coal fields under the current government's idea to be self-sufficient there, but with a coal-based economy still. You have challenges of urbanization. We know more and more the world is living in cities and those cities, depending on out, rely on out, outer lying areas, outer lying ecosystems to sustain them. And here again, you can think of sort of the most obscene uh, examples uh, like this area outside of Montreal called the Cartier d'Istrant which is described as Canada's first lifestyle center, but the lifestyle that's held up and sort of sold in glitzy advertisements is uh, basically parking lots, um, uh, global brands and, and with, with their stores. So you can shop right there, uh, a little entertainment complex with, for, for theater and, and, and movies and things like that. And then a bunch of condos. And all of that is being built on prime agricultural land. Um, what do we do uh, with, with those kinds of examples when we're talking about um, intergenerational equity and ecosystem management? You can categorize a lot of these things under this concept of land and resource grabbing or, or the way I've described it, of remote ownership and, and control over local people and ecosystems, where the remote owners and controllers, including, for example, investors um, and corporations that are doing this, uh, that are then relying on that income, say for their retirement or whatever, 
you know, you go into your stockbroker and you say, where am I getting good returns? And they'll say, hey, agriculture in Africa is where to go. And, 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 and they're saying, and you can get a 20% return. But what is that little investment contributing to in terms of displacement of people and disruption of ecosystems that are far away? Those kinds of considerations uh, don't get factored in. And then here, if you dig deep, you're talking about legacies of violent conquest and colonialism and forms of neocolonialism. So again, looking at the, tar the target audience here, how do we package that in a way that, um, that can resonate and, 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 and uh, lead, to lead uh, things in the right direction? May and maybe the, the, the catch-all phrase for, for all of these things is globalization, a globalized economy in which I mean, sometimes it seems like a musical chairs game where we're just moving um, chairs around and taking a, a few out and, um, and people in places are left uh, stranded uh, and in bad shape. Um, I think this puts in context, uh, I think I showed this last year and it's a list I find helpful to, to you know, to, that, that in our, our current, uh, economy, global, and, and worldviews. Uh, when we're talking about regeneration, we're really talking about these shifts uh, from anthropocentricity to ecocentricity, from colonialism and remote owners to localism and attachment to place, to efficiency to this idea of, of let's define what we really need and work back from there rather than look at what people want and try to satisfy that in the most efficient way, which is basically what our economy does. How can we incorporate notions of sufficiency that don't make people feel like they're um, being deprived and made to suffer. Um, and, and, and you can see uh, the, the rest uh, of the list here. So I, I think a lot of this concept and this shift towards having a greater commitment to something called regenerative um, ecosystem management involves um, a shift uh, from the column on the left aligned with growth to a column on the right around with, uh, aligned with generation regeneration. So a part of this also is to come up with case studies. And, and this will be fun because a lot of these are very hopeful examples. Um, and I'll just give a quick explanation of these. Um, so the River Ethiop is, is one of the case studies um, in a project I'm leading on ecological law case studies. And I'm working with a local NGO there and others called the um, River Ethiopia Trust Foundation. River, River Ethiop uh, flows through the Niger Delta in a uh, an area that's heavily committed to oil development. So it's, it's, it's a, an ecosystem and a set of villages and human communities that are embedded in a classic case of the resource curse where, uh, where the, the region is all about supporting extraction uh, of oil and sale for, for, for export with very little returns and in, and in fact, a lot of disruption and damage to local communities and ecosystems. So what this trust foundation is doing and, and has been quite successful with, which is why I think it's a, a case study to include here is they've had a number of stakeholder um, consultations along the stretch of a, a, the, the major stretch of this river to reorient them to their connections to the river and to place and to the ecosystems that it supports. And you know, I, I talked to Irikefi Dafe is the is the head of that, and he said when they first got started, they were they were threatened, they were attacked, they were driven out, but over time he started to connect with people and, um, and get the focus to be on the better future they can have from protecting their river in, in perpetuity. So there's a strong element of restoration here, a strong element of stakeholder engagement. Um, there is a relationship to um, countering and getting past uh, uh, issues that extractive economies can cause. And um, I shouldn't say Wanganui River there. It's, uh, it, it's, it, this is likely to be the first river in Africa that will have legal personhood established. There's legislation at both the state 
level and the federal level in Nigeria to create that recognition. So uh, I like that case study. The, the Fanganui River in New Zealand is further along in that regard in that with that river, over a hundred years of conflict and treaty violation claims of the Maori, Iwi uh, tribes there uh, were resolved in a settlement in 2017 that was then um, uh, incorporated into uh, federal legislation in New Zealand. And it gives legal personhood to the Whanganui River and it requires anybody making a decision that affects the river to take, to give first priority to Maori principles um, that reflect a kinship relationship to the river. A principles like we are the river, the river is us. So all the decision-making going forward with that river has to go through that lens um, that is grounded in indigenous worldviews. There's the park in New Zealand that I believe that's also in the watershed um, in, in, in which the, the Maori uh, guardianship, the uh, the guardianship for the park um, has a majority representation uh, from Maori. Um, it, for the Fanganui River, there's a uh, there's a guardianship created that has a, a representative from uh, the Maori and a representative from the New Zealand government. So this is a, a you know a real institutional uh, example and how this can be incorporated into legislation and, and create a new way of moving forward and considering. Um, uh, something like a river. Um, the Abrewa Atsubeha, if I said that right, watershed in Tigray, Ethiopia. Um, many of you may be familiar with John Liu's film, Hope in a Changing Climate. And this is one of the examples he gives of how ecosystems have been revived just by, by reforestation, by doing things to retain water that then supports uh, livelihoods in a better way. Europe tribes um, in California have claimed, have declared rights of the Klamath River, uh, in which they have a, a strong connection going back um, centuries. Um, I'll get, I'm gonna show you a, something about the Tideni and Nene National Park. The Los Plateau is another element of John Liu's film. Just a mind boggling transformation of the Los Plateau from a, a dusty, dry, uh, almost lifeless looking um, ecosystem to one that was just that's just verdant um, and, and filled with water again because of the way they re uh, forested the, the, the uplands um, and, 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 and directed water so that it didn't um, uh, erode and create a, a, a dusty um, uh, landscape. In the United States, you have the Kissimmee Okeechobee Over Everglades ecosystem, a huge restoration project. I think varying levels of success, but for example, the Kissimmee River, which had been channeled off into these straight uh, channels, the curves were put back in. Uh, in the Everglades, uh, south of Lake Okeechobee, there's a system of filtration marches to clean up the water and then that will then flow into the Everglades to help restore that very important ecosystem. And um, I just want to give you an example here of this ecological restoration. And um, in Latin America, because I lack America, Latin America and the Caribbean, because I think this is also really relevant to, to, to doing a report like this uh, as requested. Um, so the, an action plan that was recently adopted for ecosystem restoration in Latin America and the Caribbean in a nutshell. So this is a report that acknowledges the degree of degradation and loss of ecosystems. So I think it's important in a report like this to say, look, we're not starting, we're not, we're not just talking about preserving what we have. We've, we've, we've done damage and that has to be accounted for. And so big, like I said, a big poor part of this has to be restoration. Um, there's a vision here that I think aligns quite well with this notion of intergenerational uh, um, uh, equity. Uh, that by 2030, Latin America and the Caribbean have significantly advanced in defining policies and plans and implementing projects in restoration um, to revert the negative impacts of degradation. Uh, and as a result, ecosystems and natural habit habitats across the region are in a process of being restored, protected, and managed sustainably. And sustainably there incorporates the idea of inter intergenerational equity. It discusses barriers that have to, um, to be overcome and then some 10 
so, so some path, pathways and action items uh, for supporting the restoration process. So very much a management oriented um, project um, that uh, incorporates notions of intergenerational equity, I think quite well. And I'm going to, um, I'm getting close to finish, but I want to, I want to share this. Um, Established Canada's 47th National Park, an Indigenous protected area, by today in a National Park Reserve, the land of the ancestors. <laughs> us, it's a new relationship uh, with the Letzel K. Dene First Nation, as well as signing agreements yesterday with the Northwest um, Territory Métis Nation. So these are truly historic agreements. They set a new standard for our collaboration with Indigenous people. And in part, what we're doing is we're not only protecting a natural area, we are protecting a cultural landscape that is of significance to people that have been on these lands since time immemorial. We have over the years looked after the land, but in order you know, to make sure that uh, the land is protected, we need other people to help us to do that. And that's why you know, today is such an important day because we were able to have partners helping us to, to uh, protect the area that we call Fight the Nana. Well, the, uh, the Fight the Nana Trust, it is a trust. Uh, uh, we'll be using the revenues from that trust. We'll never be touching the principal. And the way we design the trust is that the, it'll be owned by the First Nations, the First Nations and the First Nations. So they could add their own their own capital to that and grow the trust over the years. The more money we go into the trust, the more revenues we'll have, the more we can do on our end. The Thaidan and Any Fund will be a fifteen million dollar endowment that can be spent by Lutzelke and it will pay for their involvement in the co-management of Thaidan and Any. And it also pays for some training. They can use it for training um, and capacity building of their land steward and water stewardship programs. And our role in it was um, raising the funding that went into the $15 million. It has also been um, paired with funding from the federal government as well for a total of $30 million fund. Nature United uh, has been working with the Lutzel K. Denny First Nation for over 10 years. At times that's been mapping work, at times that's been uh, strategic work and helping to uh, build pathways for new legislation to the Thaiden and our fund. And we're really proud of the work that we've been doing here. Having the, the human and financial capital afforded by the Nature United, afforded to uh, get leadership and negotiating team to stay ahead of Canada and stay ahead of the government of Northwest Territories in driving the agenda that, that was decided in the process. And because of that, I think we've got a product that's uh, decolonized. Uh, it's a product that's new uh, and it speaks to reconciliation. It's good for the Indigenous people, it's good for Canadians, and it's definitely good for the lands and the, and the animals. The vision of our elders has been to protect the land. And, and that's important, like that's something that has passed on uh, from generation to generation. We were always told, and I can remember as a child, uh, that means watch over the land. And so, you know, we take that very seriously because it's a land that uh, sustains us and we have to look after the land. We have to. Plaidemanu is our homeland. Uh, it's the heart of our homeland. Our homeland is much bigger than Fagin and Yenna. But that's the area that the elders identified for us to protect from industrial development, to protect the biodiversity, uh, to protect the keystone species that give life to us, the land that gives life, life to us as a Yenna. It 
gives us a sense of identity, a great sense of responsibility. Uh, it will continue to provide that, that, that space uh, that we can call home forever. Uh, and everybody needs a home as well. Okay, and um, here I just uh, very quickly as I finish up here, this is the, the format that I'm, uh, uh, that the report is, uh, will take. These are the sections I'm asked to complete. So understanding the strategy, talking about public sector situation and trends. So I think I might give some examples of some of these evolutionary approaches, and, which would be typical of the US and maybe revolutionary approaches. For example, the Whanganui River case, uh, rights of nature cases, methods of implementation. Well, there's many things that could be relevant here. Rights of nature, you know, discount rates in economics um, are ways of how we value the future or not. And you can have huge differences in results depending on the rate that you assign to those. Um, some of the worst climate modeling uh, has very high uh, discount rates, which means that the future is, just, is, is treated very, uh, is not important. Uh, you can do state of environment reporting to get baselines on which to uh, assess what needs to be protected and what needs to be restored and improved. Um, uh, you have to pay attention on, in this section, I think, on inst institutional needs and capacity and so on. Um, and again, I think uh, my, a reminder to myself is that this needs to, to look at um, implementation from the local to the national to the regional and to the global scale, even if the main audience is at the national government scale. And then a section on case stu studies, a section on peer, peer learning, and a section on international development uh, cooperation. So I'm going to close here with these queries, um, things that would be um, I'm interested in hearing about in, in, in addition to any other comments you have. What other ideas or approaches come to mind for integrating intergenerational equity into ecosystem management? What's the best way to frame these issues for the target audience of public sector institutions and actors around the world? How can we best characterize and deal with the trade-offs that are inevitable when considering unavoidable impacts of human use of ecosystems for provisioning? Are there any other case studies that would illustrate key points about implementing approaches to ecosystem management that take into account intergenerational equity and any other suggestions or ideas that come to mind for the project? Um, and with that, I will thank you for your attention and uh, look forward to, to what you have to say.